afternoon, brilliant humans, and welcome back to fabulous Chicago. We're live streaming here from KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, CNCF's largest North American event. My name is Savannah Peterson, and I am joined by two really interesting people. First off, my co-host Rob, you're doing an absolutely stellar job. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're going to be interesting in this. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to step <laughs> up my discussion. game and get up. I just up, introduced you as interesting, so yes. let's hope we can yeah, make we'll, it happen. We'll try to step up my game today. So I love that. We are also celebrating women in tech with Inc. on the show today. Just casually, please welcome Emily. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You're like a star here today. This is your fourth appearance at various <laughs> things. How are you feeling? What's it like to be on the KubeCon show floor? Uh, it's good. It's nice to actually be here after co-chairing KubeCon for a couple of times now. I get to enjoy the conference in between interviews. That is good. So you you used to be a co-chair, still are? No, no longer a co-chair. My last uh, circuit was in Amsterdam, so I, I did my three tours and I, I'm done for a while. <laughs> I sense that that's great. You've done your contribution and now you're ready. That's to, exactly right. Ready to ride. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Red Hat and what's going on for you now. Uh, so I'm new to Red Hat. I've only been here less than three months now, but I'm there. Congrats on the new gig. Thank you. I lead deal. our security team in Emerging Technologies, um, which is a group that is focused around understanding a little bit more about where technology is headed, what are some of the new innovations, and how do we grow those communities and those ecosystems and turn them into more robust projects and eventually products for Red Hat. I'm also our security community architect working with our open source program office to identify security community ecosystems like the Open Source Security Foundation, Technical Advisory Group for Security Ooh. and CNCF, and understanding more about where they're headed, what is it that they're looking at, and bringing that back into Red Hat. So you're very much kind of on the future forward front yes. of the boat here. It's super fun. Yeah, that sounds, wow, that sounds super interesting. Ooh, man, since you're in your first 90 days, what's gotten you the most excited since you joined? Um, continuation of software supply chain security, because that's kind of like my, my forte and where I really came in. Um, but some of the other things that I'm learning about now, like edge computing, AI security, as well as remote attestation for nodes, um, post-quantum cryptography is another area that I'm looking into for how do we bring those out from the open source upstream projects all the way into operating systems that consumers yeah. don't have to deal with, how to update those libraries. So, so with you, the, seeing it's your 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 bailiwick with uh, <laughs> supply chain. For me, uh, how far do we need to go beyond S bombs? A lot. Okay. S bombs are not a silver bullet. Um, I gave a talk about this a long time ago. That they're not going to solve all of our software supply chain problems. They're just one important component. Um, but there's so much more in software supply chain security that needs to happen. Um, we've done a great job since uh, Log for Shell happened and since Solar Winds and understanding more about like what is good security practices for software development yeah. and DevSecOps movements helped shift a lot of that focus and attention left. So we've got more uh, capabilities like SigStore and doing commit signing and signing artifacts, that's great. But we still have the user education side that goes with it. It's great if we're signing things, but you also have to be checking to make sure that they're signed by who you expect them to be and verifying that content. Um, in addition to that, software bill of materials are great. A lot of organizations are starting to produce them, but they don't necessarily understand how they should be using them. So learning more about technologies like Guac, which are actually creating mechanisms for consumers of software to understand what's in them and where they're being deployed and what that risk is is very important. Well, it was funny because uh, you bringing that up and it was we had on uh, some of your colleagues from Red Hat earlier today and we were talking talking about uh, one of my favorite things, which is uh, Backstage, and the Backstage plugins that are now going through secure, they're being secured. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about the fact that, hey, these plugins, I have to go recode to plug them in, but I have no way of you know, verifying, and now there's a marketplace for that and some verification. Are you seeing a lot more about how you're looking towards the future, how you bring that kind of attestation to all of the different pieces, because to me, that's the biggest, always the biggest question mark with open source is, is it secure or not? Where did it come from? How do I know it's valid? Before I go plug it in in my environment and then 
oh well. Introduce was, chaos. Yeah, in in, in, yeah, introduce some malware that I didn't yeah. know how it got in there. It's funny that you mentioned that. So without the advancements that we've made post log for shell we wouldn't be able to have some of these conversations and software supply chain security is actually driving a lot of the zero trust conversations that are now coming to the forefront because it's not necessarily about just signing and verification, it's actually understanding what it went into the build and whether or not you can make decisions about that information because what is an acceptable security posture for you is going to be very different from somebody that works in a national security systems and they have higher considerations and assurance guarantees that need to occur. So yes, definitely we're seeing a yeah. lot more of these principles and concepts being applied across different technology areas and now starting to have conversations about it for AI systems as well. I, I was going to say, because to me, that's one of the things is uh, <laughs> injecting in through prompt engineering, injecting in uh, malicious either code or actually data into it so that it, it is returning you know, false negatives or injecting if you're using a co-pilot or mm -hmm. what have you. Is that, are you starting to see those attacks like starting to come up or I, I, I've heard about one, but. I'm not necessarily seeing them, but a good security person doesn't necessarily need to know the exploit is out there running in the wild to be prepared for it. So having these conversations now before we have a solar winds like event for AI is very important. Getting yeah. people to start understanding that with large language models, there's an integrity mechanism that needs to be verified so that you know that the data that went into the model to train it is producing kind of the expected results that you're looking for and having the ability to independently verify that. It's just like when you build a software artifact. You want all that metadata so you can say, all right, it's allowed to go in this environment but not this one because these certain things weren't performed. We want to be able to do the same thing with AI workloads, is verifying where they came from, what went into their creation, are they subject to hallucination, for instance, and then what their confidence score is as well. What percentage of the conversations that you're having, since you touch a lot of things <laughs> future for our word, and AI is such a hot topic, as you said, the show is AI, AI, AI. Yeah. What percentage of the conversations that you're having are focused on AI versus on other emerging tools and tech? A lot of them are around AI because it's, a lot of people don't understand the space very well. I, like, I'm still learning, I'm still figuring that In out fairness, myself. we are all still learning. Yes, exactly. There are very few true experts out there. Don't yep. believe the armchair experts, folks. They're, they're pulling your leg right now. Yeah. But a lot of it, has been around AI because people see it as a huge disruptor. Um, I was in a conversation earlier today where somebody had made mention that it's going to have about the same impact as kind of the internet is. So a lot of the things that Casual we're saying, statement. yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about today on AI possibilities and AI security may not be true in a year, in two years, and three years as we start learning more about them. But it's a balanced conversation. AI is really just another workload with special needs that we need to design cloud native technologies to accomplish accommodate, but also how do we take large language models or um, predictive AI and use that to improve our infrastructure? How do we help balance the conversation around yeah. AI use and sustainable uh, compute utilization as Another well? Another topic that we've been having. And right now they're butting heads. I keep hearing the conversation of this is a problem and yet here's the solution, but we, we kind of want to have our cake and eat it too, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, and, and that's in, in the cryptography space, whether we're talking about blockchain or we're talking about AI or we're talking about any of this, it is the compute challenge and there yes. is power. I mean, you mentioned earlier, Rob, I love this stat, two glasses of water, 18 ounces of water every five. Uh, 16 ounces of water for every chat yeah, exactly. GPT, five chat GPT prompts that go wow. through Microsoft's data center in Idaho. Wow. And it uses, I mean, That's when you're wild. talking about a 16 ounce bottle of water evaporating. Yeah, two glasses of water, water. It's, it's chaos. Yes. Yeah. I guess it is two glasses of water. I, I was just a little step Thank ahead you. on the math there. It's, it's okay. okay, we'll get you there. Um, um, Man um, math, women you know, math, it's, it's a running yeah, meme right now. It's, it's okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think what's interesting around security in, in general, and again, being in the office of the CTO and really getting to look forward on that is the fact that there's also been a lot around social engineering that's come into this as well. I mean, the MGM thing was totally socially engineered, but it, there's things to, the, you know, two-factor authentication that could have been used. There's different types of keys versus SMS, and I, I came out of that complaining about a bank I used that was still using SMS, and it drives me nuts. What, what other things in Kubernetes are, you know, as you look at this, the entire security plane there, are big red flashing flags that really people are aiming at right now to go and address, but we're not there yet. That need more help, need more resources put on it. 
Well, I'm just going to say flat out, the entire ecosystem needs more contributors. Those are the resources that we actually need. And Kubernetes is, is, is a really good example of this. Because it's been so prolific within the cloud native ecosystem and we have so many users totally. of that project, we're not seeing the return come back in from a contributions perspective. So when you're an adopting organization and you have demands or wants and features of Kubernetes or any of the cloud native projects, what the concern then comes in is we don't have enough people to do it. And we have to start being very selective of which features we're going to work on and how we're going to do it. Because if you're not there to speak up and champion it and put in the work, chop the wood and carry the water, it's not really going to happen. That, to me, is the biggest risk in the ecosystem from a security perspective is we've got all these great projects. They've now become that little piece that everybody relies on as part of the internet working. What happens when everybody decides to retire and move to the mountains? We need to have that pipeline of contributors to fix those problems. I think that's such an astute and powerful observation. I think it's really important. I mean, CNCF, this is all about the community. Exactly. You used to be one of the co-chairs without everyone here contributing. There literally isn't all of us sitting in this room, Correct. let alone the tools that so many companies and people are relying exactly. on. How, I, I actually really want to ask you this because I think this is interesting. How would you, or how are you actively recruiting to do more community members or more interest in this space? If, if someone's watching this, let's say that maybe is not as deep down the Kubernetes hole as the rest of us at this table, what would you tell them about contributing to the ecosystem and collaborating and being involved? Start by showing up to a meeting. And I'm actually glad that you asked this question because I was talking with somebody about it today, is that the CNCF has technical advisory groups and they really serve a, an entire domain of technology area like security or like environmental sustainability and runtime. Those are all examples of them. The nice thing about getting involved there is you don't need to be an expert on any project or technology. You can come in with a learning mindset and just do the work, roll up your sleeves, figure out what needs to be done to advance that domain forward. And during that process, you get exposed yeah. to a lot of cloud native projects. It's a great way to familiarize yourself with projects like Falco or like Spiffy Inspire or a Key Cloak, which is kind of like where I got involved in those projects was through Tag Security and through the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee. So there's a lot of opportunities just by showing up, yeah. asking questions, be curious. driving the conversation, and don't be afraid to try something new. I mean, even as we were talking and I was asking you about an acronym, you said there are no stupid questions. And I think, I mean, just speaking frankly, I knew absolutely nothing about Kubernetes until about four years ago. I did not know what was going on in this ecosystem. And it's been so fun to learn and, and I've really felt like a lot of people, to your exact example, have helped teach me. I mean, you included taught me something earlier today and will probably continue to teach me as time goes on. I think that's great. Particularly because I'm sure you've noticed there's a line for the men's room and not for the ladies' room. Oh, I don't yeah. normally like to play the gender game, but we've got two strong ink lasses on this that's stage right. right now. And so I am going to call it out. What do you think other folks in our ecosystem could be doing to encourage more allyship across the board? It doesn't just have to be gender. And then how do we recruit more awesome people like us to be talking and passionate about? I think there's, there's still some, not necessarily unconscious bias, but I think there is this kind of broken rung, I think is the correct term, yeah. that allows um, non-men to get into technical positions and to do contributions to the projects. A lot of women in tech that I have talked to have felt that as long as they do the work and they get recognized for it, they're great. But a lot of the difference between men going into technical contribution roles and even technical leadership roles is a lot of them see it as, here's the potential that I can provide you, whereas with women we're like, look at what I already did, but it's it's probably not that great. And that's something that we also need to overcome. The tonal shift. So for us within the TOC, being able to recognize contributors for the work that they've done and demonstrate the impact both to them, like you did this thing and it had this impact on the ecosystem, and then allowing them to take that content and give it back to their employer so that they understand the value of that. Because we don't do enough thank yous in technology. We don't do enough embracing. Amen. And we Seriously. don't have enough empathy for each other. And I feel like that is yeah. something that needs to become more paramount. Because the more empathetic conversations that you have, 
the more like, hey, let's have a conversation. How can I help you? What challenges are you experiencing? I might not have the answers, but I can certainly connect you with somebody that might. Having that kind of discussion, that's how we bring more non-males into the ecosystem. And that's what makes Cloud Native Computing Foundation so attractive to a more diverse contributor base. Oh yeah. And we still have a long way to go, but we've made a lot of strides. We have, and every time I see Priyanka up there talking, it makes me feel good. Yeah, think about all those little girls watching for the first time. Yep. We've got Cassandra from uh, one of the daughters of the JFrog team who teaches teenagers by using FIPI and how to learn Kubernetes. I mean, there, there's there's so many things in this space that really do give me hope. But I think you you hit on you gave me chills when you said there's not enough thank yous in technology. And I think you're absolutely right. We forget we 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 talk about how the machines might take our jobs. We forget that we treat each other like machines in our jobs already half the time. And it's honestly quite heartbreaking. So I just want to say thank you for yeah. bringing that up. That well, was I'm glad you asked the question. Yeah, it's, it's not often talked about enough. And the more that we can discuss it in an open and frank manner in the effort to improve things, the better we're going to get. Absolutely, and I love that you brought up that mirror, showing people what they've really done, because there is that bashfulness, that tall puppy, that modesty, and it comes across the industry in a lot of different ways, but saying, hey, no, no, you did this. You know, reinforcing that, I think is really special and helping it's, them amplify. It's the positive side of accountability that we don't ever exercise enough. It is enough. the positive side of accountability. We always think we're going to get in trouble. God forbid we celebrate the wins. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's also, and again, not being female, I, you know, I don't live in that world, but I, from the You're an folks, ally though, Rob. But I absolutely, and I, I think from the people that I've been, have been on my teams as a head of a product at multiple startups, what I saw was, it was exactly that, that mirror, and how do you help them get past, you know, almost the imposter, you know. That's what it is. Yeah. You know, scenario where they're, they're thinking, hey, I can't do that, versus giving them, hey, positive reinforcement about, hey, when I w went and first did this, I wasn't 100% right on it, and nobody's ever 100% right on it the first time. Don't worry about it, keep going and keep, you know, pushing forward on these, activities and you will have success. And I, I think that definitely, you know, I, I have a young daughter and that's, you know, she's going off into a STEM field and she's very happy about that. Yeah, Good absolutely. Job, Dad. Yeah, I try. I, I mean, again, and I, I look at it with her and I think because she's been raised that way and I, I think that that is my little hope for, you know, more balance and more people in that is that, again, we do talk about it here openly and have that discussion, so. It's funny that you mentioned that. Fred Kautz talked about this earlier today um, during one of the keynotes. He was uh, recalling a, an inscription that Chris Nova had provided him in a book that she had written. It was, thank you for believing in me. And as parents, we do that for our kids. And as community members, we should be doing that for each other. Letting somebody know that you believe that they're capable of doing something sometimes is the, the thing that they need to unlock that potential. I want us just to give a master class on empowerment <laughs> up here. I mean, I love everything that we're talking about. I love what we're talking about security, talking about software supply chain, which is yeah. also, everything we've talked about in the last few minutes is not talked about enough. So I'm so glad that we're having this conversation. This will definitely have to be another conversation that we continue. I love, I love the parent piece. We had, we had Michael from your team up here earlier, and he was saying that his four-year-old daughter was reading him some of the cloud native books. That's awesome. Um, just last night he actually showed me a picture <laughs> It melted my heart. She was also a dinosaur for Halloween, which is absolutely just precious. <laughs> but do you think that that's, you've been a part of a lot of communities, you're clearly passionate in the DevOps space. Do you think that that's one of the very unique things about the CNCF community, or do you think that's open source community at large? I think it's something that's unique to CNCF, and yeah. I think that's what makes us so successful is our community and the open embracing culture that we have. When it works the way it should, we're not perfect by all mm -hmm. means, and we can always iterate and improve upon like where we are today to where we need to be in the next two to five years. But for us, it's that sense of community and camaraderie, like looking around at the in memoriam this morning and seeing like a lot of people that I know and people I don't know in tears and choked up at, at the losses that we've experienced this year, it's because they're almost like family for us. Like, that I check works. in with community members I talk to, hey, are you doing okay? I saw this was going on, how can I help you? Let me know if you need any kind of support, or if you want me to take the workload off of your plate, because sometimes that's what we need. We need to be able to step away, and we don't encourage that as a safe thing to do. And right. that's something that we can certainly improve on as well. Well, and we for, you know, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's one of the beautiful things. I talk about community here all the time. Community is really special and that and, and separates us from the machines. But it is that, how are you really doing? 
not just what are you doing. Yep. How 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 is your heart? How's your soul? It's been a savage couple of years. It has been, and a lot of people like since the pandemic it they would kind of withdrew a little bit from society, so we're all relearning how to behave around each other. <laughs> yeah. Very true. As the last few KubeCons have shown, this yes. is a general social awkwardness, level 10 for sure. Right, yes. but it's through like getting together in these kinds of events, either in person or even virtually online, because there is a large virtual attendance for KubeCon. We want to make sure yeah. that people have those opportunities to connect with folks, either within their time zone or outside of it, because Cloud Native is an international community, which means we have all sorts Super of different cultures and perspectives, yeah. and everybody has their own job that they do every single day, and Cloud Native is just yet another hat that they wear. They're like wonderful hobby that helps make the world better. I mean, there's something really magical about people who go home and yes. they're like, and I'm going to continue to build with my friends somewhere else that I may or may not ever meet. I think, I think it's pretty spectacular. All right, Emily, I've got a question I've never asked anyone this, but I think since we talked about the journey a lot, where'd you get your confidence from? It's inspiring. Uh, a lot of it is fake it till you make it. Um, <laughs> I, I right. kind of go that's in. That's adulting. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I go into a lot of stuff with like an open mind because I'm not an expert on everything and nor will I try to be, but I look to learn as much as I can. And part of that is being confident that I'm in a learning place and that I can always learn from others. And I also firmly believe in like sharing the information that I've gained. So like I've talked about this in several of my keynotes about knowledge glaciers and sharing information and leading yes. the way to bring others Long, and that's a skill that as technologists, we don't do a good enough job at. How do we communicate effectively with our peers to get our point across? If you can't successfully sell your project through an elevator pitch, we have a communication challenge. You should be able to do that. And oh if gosh, it's yeah. Too They'll complex, tell that to some of the booths out here in the back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Seriously. <laughs> it needs to be simple, and a lot yeah, of that is practice, be open to change, understand that you're going to have limitations, and it's okay to be vulnerable and humble about that. Oh God, yes. Hey man, everybody needs to drink a coffee of that confidence right there. And it's true, it's the curiosity. It's okay to be curious, ask questions. And, yep. and this community in particular, unlike some of the uptight tech bros that live with me in the Silicon Valley, is, is extremely welcoming and, and embracing. All right, final question for you because I've got a unicorn on my body. Not sure which cam we're looking at, but I'll look at all three. Uh, you self-identify as a security unicorn. Yes. What does that mean? So I feel like I'm in a very strange part of the security community. When I talk to other security professionals, they're either hackers, they do penetration testing, maybe they do a little bit of design work. It's kind I, of the first thing I think of, yeah. I kind of came at security from a very different perspective. Prior to joining technology, I was a creative director for an entertainment company, so running events and doing kind of event management is my jam. But because I wasn't born into hacking all the time, I'm not a coder. I don't program, if you saw my code, it's atrocious. So I, I bring a very different perspective to it. So I ask very different questions than what most software Diversity engineers are used to. Exactly, that's right. And that, that's what I feel makes me a security unicorn, or in some cases I say I'm a security T-Rex. I might be a little old school in tech, but even still, I'm new that. and I'm kind of novel. Do you have a favorite dinosaur? Stegosaurus. Beautiful. We Dinosaurs have been a theme of the show no, somehow today, say. and I'm, I'm loving it. I'm feeling the dino yeah. vibes. My gosh, Emily Fox, thank you so much for being for here. Seriously. Me. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely wonderful to have you. I'm very confident you'll be chatting with us many more times. The Moxie okay. Fox, if you want to find her on the internet, folks, Emily Fox of Red Hat. Rob, thank you so much for the great. wonderful conversation as always. And thank you all for tolerating listening to me for a little bit longer than usual because that was far too entertaining to wrap in 15 <laughs> minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Savannah Peterson, live here from Chicago at CNCF's KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, and you're watching theCUBE, the leading source for emerging tech news.